He was born with a loud and unmistakable voice. A voice that would bolster his God-given vocation to preach, to teach, to catechize and to convert. He lived for a while in the comparative solitude of the wilderness, but ultimately he would come to be known by all. He was deemed controversial for his commitment to the truth and was considered polarizing for his Christocentric theology. Loved by many, hated by others, ignored by no one. He had a particularly perplexing relationship with political leaders. Although we are told that they liked to listen to him, for he was certainly never boring, the same leaders were often challenged by his moral convictions, particularly, for example, his defense of the definition of marriage. Ultimately, this powerful preacher would become a political prisoner. But even then, despite difficulties and doubts, his faith in Christ never wavered. In fact, it was purified, strengthened, and remains a powerful witness to the fact that truth always prevails, even in suffering. In light of recent circumstances, you may have assumed that I'm speaking about the late George Cardinal Pell. You would be wrong. For everything I have just said, in fact, describes the protagonist's name in today's gospel, St. John the Baptist. Until now, I hadn't really thought of Cardinal Pell as having much in common with a man who exclusively wore camel hair and lived on a diet of wild honey and locusts. However, such cosmetic differences are largely superficial. For underneath the surface of their haberdashery, at the core of their identity, at the center of their hearts, at the deepest recesses of their being, you and I can discern an undeniable similarity. John the Baptist and George Pell both loved Jesus Christ fearlessly. Fearlessly being the optimal word. Pell was born in the comparative wilderness of Ballarat. His voice, too, was unique. Not just in tone, volume, or inflection, but most importantly in content. Even if you did not agree with him, he was always considered worth listening to. In fact, his weekly column in the Sunday Telegraph was said to have been the second most read thing in the entire newspaper. Such was the influence and efficaciousness of that man's voice in forestalling the decline of faith in this country and in championing the rights of the unborn and the dying that Pell's ideological enemies always deemed him worth turning out to protest. I would interpret that as a deep compliment. Young people like myself were drawn to the Cardinal's voice because what he preached, although often challenging and confronting, although controversial and countercultural, always pointed to Christ the Lamb. And it was always, in doctrine, unashamedly Catholic. Like St. John the Baptist, Pell was a man who dared to stand up publicly irrespective of the personal cost, he would intelligently and persuasively argue against every populist yet false idea of happiness, freedom, and the so-called good life that is propounded by our increasingly godless culture. A culture that celebrates materialism, that promotes indifference to the truth, that encourages licentiousness and lewdness all under the pretext that doing whatever you want will make you happy. However, we all deep down know that that cultural voice is empty. That voice is shallow. That voice never endures. 
that voice always changes its tune to the sound of popular opinion and in consequence that voice leaves people unhappy and as such it cannot be true. It is critical to the re-evangelization of the church and our country that the worldly voice that says compromise your values, acquiesce to confusion, engage in doctrinal gymnastics is never allowed to mollify or mute the eternal voice of Christ. To do so would render us both as individuals and as a community entirely incapable of pointing out the Lamb of God to others. And we are all called to be St. John the Baptists today. Individuals who know and can point out the truth to others in an age that is increasingly confused as to what it actually means to be human. If we do otherwise, if we compromise, if we acquiesce, then we will only ever be able to point to graven, graven images of ourselves. It would be tantamount to making God in our own image, in accordance with our own whimsical tastes and theological predilections. But such images never inspire saints, for such images are never worth witnessing to, and certainly they are never worth dying for. As Cardinal Pell himself said just before he died, bishops are, and I'd say by extension priests, are not just wallflowers or rubber stamps. They are, he says, to be the guarantor of continuing fidelity to Christ's teaching and to the apostolic tradition. This indeed is the secret to our vitality and our future. Controversial? Absolutely. And proudly so. For the word controversial literally means to be turned against. How could we not be turned against a society that is entirely turned in on itself? On that score, Christ was the most controversial figure of history. Now, I appreciate that some of you throughout the week have told me that you never liked Cardinal Pell. And although, as you can probably tell, I evidently loved and admired the Cardinal, I certainly never agreed with everything he said or did. But that's inevitable. <laughs> All of you, I'm sure, however, would have seen the manifest split in public opinion. He has been heralded by, heralded by leaders and people all over the world, including two former Australian Prime Ministers, as one of the greatest churchmen of all time, a martyr for truth and free speech. Others, however, have accused him of being a ruthless and draconian hierarch who was complicit in clerical cover-ups. Some still question his innocence despite a unanimous acquittal of crimes that, given the circumstances, were impossible to have commit, been committed. Now, of course, this is not the time to try and work through such complex and painful matters. I'm currently writing a longer essay on the topic, and I'd be very happy to share that with you when it's finished. My only recommendation to each and every one of you today is if you're interested, always read widely and evaluate the evidence. It is not my place, by any stretch of the imagination, to tell you what to think. But I do think I have a responsibility as your parish priest to encourage you to think for yourselves. Do not imbibe media as gospel. Things are often so much more complicated and so much more nuance is needed. During my time when I was studying at Oxford, I once serendipi serendipitously sat next to a Don who remembered Pell as a default student, then aged in his late 20s. And so I asked him, you know, what was the Cardinal like back then? And the Don replied to me with three words, a kind brute, a kind brute. And at first blush, such a description seemed a contradiction. How could he be kind and a brute? So I pushed him for clarity. 
And the Don explained that when you were with Pell, one to one, he could be very endearing, convivial, and the most kind-hearted man you'd ever meet. But when you were in debate with him, he would defend his position with brute force. That resonated with my experience. Away from the spotlight, the man I knew as my archbishop was exactly that. Genial, humorous, kind and endearing. But when it came to defending Christ, he would, like John the Baptist, speak the truth fearlessly and with brute force when necessary. Although Pell's earthly voice, loud voice, has been rendered silent, I have no doubt now his intercessory prayers for us and for our beloved church are more powerful than ever. If I could guess, Pell would be praying that we would all remember, in the words of his good and late friend, Pope Benedict XVI, that when it comes to our love for Christ, for his word, for his truth, the truth is the truth, and there can be no compromise.